Hello, welcome back and welcome if you're new. I thought I would talk a bit today about inspiration. So as a textile artist, one of the things I get asked quite a lot when I design quilts and collages and things like that is where do I get my ideas from? So I thought I would tell you about a particular quilt that I've been working on for quite a long time and you'll see why and how I came to start making it and hopefully you'll find it interesting and you'll want to find out more about the original quilt. About 15 years ago I was asked by my mum if I wanted to go and visit this manor house in uh, Cambridgeshire to go and see this lady's quilts and she was talking about this lady called Lucy Boston and I have the patchworks of Lucy Boston here. We went to visit this this beautiful house and I think in here there is an end plate. I don't know if you can see this is it here little house. You can go and see most of the patchworks in this book at the manor Hemingford Grey in Huntingdon. We went and we were walking around the house and we were looking at the various quilts. She's got some very old ones that she bought to hang up at windows and things when she bought this house and as we walked around I had this very strange sense that the house was very familiar to me and the gardens when we'd walked through those to approach the house. When we got up to the attic this is what the attic looks like and somebody in the group because we were a party of about nine people I suppose said, oh my goodness, this is Tolly's room. I suddenly realised that Lucy Boston not only was an extremely talented patchworker, but she was also a children's author. And I had read all of her books as a child. That's why the house seems so familiar to me. And then of course, as an adult, I've got more into uh, textiles and making things. I couldn't quite believe it so I sort of floated around the house in a dream in a bit of a daze but as we as we walked around I was very taken with her style of patchworking and she was a patchworker not a quilter. None of her patchworks are quilted at all. They're literally made up as, as bedspreads. Um, you yeah, know very very traditional. So when we were walking around we saw this quilt and this is the patchwork of the crosses and I want to show you my version of these blocks today but I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about Lucy Boston. So the house that she lived in was uh, built somewhere in the 1130s. Yes you heard that right so it was a Norman house and it has the reputation for being one of the oldest continuously inhabited homes in Britain or in the UK. And you can still visit it today. And so it's always been a family home. It was never a castle or, you know, any sort of fort or anything. It was literally a family home. And the, this picture shows you this is, so here's the extension and this is part of the original building. And you can see it's got a, there's a Norman arch there, which is a very rounded sort. And if you are interested in architecture, you'll know that it's some years later that you get the, the more Gothic style with the pointed arches. So this is much earlier. So not only was Lucy Boston a prolific patchworker and author of books, but she was obviously absolutely obsessed with fabric. This is a description from her friend Caroline Hemming who went shopping with her on, on one occasion and she writes, Shopping for cottons was as exhilarating as any other specialist chase. Much would depend on whether it was a good year. You might draw a blank with crude designs and dyes or fashion might decree subtle batiks as in the astronomer patchwork. That's referring to another patchwork in the book. In which case you would buy as much as you dared. I was in Liberty with Lucy in 1952, buying cottons with her, characteristic authority and instant painter's eye for what would or would not do. It was an exhilarating half hour and we left with the usual frisson of pleasurable guilt. And I think any quilter, patchworker or anybody that's into fabric will totally recognise that. That feeling of going in and thinking, what have they got? What am I going to be able to find? What's going to inspire me? Is there going to be enough on the bolt? You know, can I afford more than more than a meter or a yard? And I, I really liked that. And then this was a letter from uh, from Lucy to Caroline, and it says, "Dearest Caroline, possibly a friendship quilt can include old crones sewing." She's referring to herself. 
when you consider that I can't see the eye of the needle, the thread if silco, the edge of the material, the point of the needle and the stitch that I have made. In fact, in my agony of blindness, I even sewed my dressing gown skirt into it. So it's very sad that her eyesight was failing, but she has her sort of customary humour about something we've all done. So this is the patchwork of the crosses and you can see that it's made out of blocks um, and they use a different type of hexagon to what we're used to or what most people that do or start doing English paper piecing do. So this is not a standard hexagon. This is a long hexagon and over here in the UK we refer to this as a church window, not honeycomb and I'll explain why. So this is uh, the complete book of patchwork quilting and applique by Linda Seward and this was published in I don't know sometime. So here we have, she talks about honeycomb as an overall description for hexagons so but what we mean as honeycomb is a standard just six sides um, and all points are equal between so here there's uh, she's even written a little bit it says templates select honeycomb church window or coffin shape to make your hexagon quilt so church window is the one that ends in the point and the coffin shape is the one that ends with two short sides for obvious reasons so that's if, if, if someone calls it a honeycomb shape just double check what they mean whether it's a long hexagon or whether it's actually just a normal hexagon and I'm going to show you how to make a long hexagon so to make a church window template I've just measured some shop bought ones here um, these are different size to mine. Um, I made this one and this is some that my mum gave me. There's not an awful lot in it. I probably could get away with using them but I'm not going to. For purposes of you making your own templates if you want to, I thought I would give you the measurements. So these measure one and three eighths across the middle and then each of these sides is an inch. So if I start off by making a rectangle, which is one inch by one and three eighths, and then I'll show you what else to do. We do the one and three eighths, and then an inch. When you've drawn your rectangle, you need to divide it into half. So half an inch is four eighths of an inch. So it's five and a half, which is 11 sixteenths which is there. Right. You only need to do that once, so I'm sorry if your brain hurts, mine hurts now. Then draw a line through the middle and then using an inch rule, you put the inch measurement on the point of your rectangle and the other end of the inch measurement on your straight line. Just keep jiggling until they fit and then join them together. You can see that this is gonna start to make this shape here. So once you've cut out some templates, like these you need to make for this type of quilt you definitely need to make yourself a window template and it doesn't have to be fancy it just needs to be something where you can use it like a viewfinder on your fabric so these are both a bit ropey I need a new one so let's make a new one you need to put your template on it make sure there's a bit of an allowance all the way around grab some sort of marking implement me and my trusty biro and just draw all the way around. So I've drawn all the way around and then you need to add a quarter of an inch seam allowance all the way around. So just using um, a quilt ruler or something so that you can see through. So all I'm doing is I'm putting the quarter inch line on the line that I already drew around the template and then I'm just going to literally draw straight lines all the way around. So I have paper scissors so just cut it out. It's quite easy to do because if you use a pen it leaves like a little dent in the card. Okay, I lied about the scissors. I couldn't find a small paper scissors. So I'm going to use a um, craft knife. So the fun part is, for me, the fabrics. <laughs> I think the fabrics are really cool. So this is the, the overview and you can't really see very much of what's going on. So here's a little detail part and you can see quite clearly that these are the hexagons. And this bit here is a really good example of the sort of fussy cutting that you can do to get these amazing effects. 
Now, she called her quilt the patchwork of the crosses, and I certainly started out intending to make something very similar in feel, definitely not in style, because I can't get these 50s and 60s fabrics and all the ones that she already had in her collection. Looking at her, the close-ups of this quilt and having seen it in real, real life, it's amazing what you can use in different places, and it has different effects. So this and this are actually the same fabric, but it's been extended up here um, and all the way through you can see like there's a little border part here but here it's a stripe that's the same fabric too and then here's a close-up of another one of the blocks and that is made out of hexagons and which is quite incredible so the the hexagons start making this square these are two different ones here to continue that stripe and it's really quite clever what she's done so the type of fabrics you need are actually quite hard to get hold of, which is why I haven't finished my quilt, because um, I've been collecting them for so long. So these are some of the fabrics that I've used. So you can see where I've cut pieces out. I'll show you one of the patchwork pieces that I've made. So there's this one. And you can see this is definitely made out of hexagons on the back, in the shape there. Then if I turn it over, I've managed to do this fussy cutting thing where I've made like this little circle. Here's another one that I've made. And I really like how you can make squares and lines in different places. For this block, what I've done is I've used a little viewfinder template thing and laid it out and then just cut it all the way along. Uh, and this one, this is a Ginny Bear one, and this is so useful because there's so many different borders and actually, if you're a quilter that likes to make borders, um, you'll know that border prints, which is what most of the things I use are, are so hard to find. And there is no particular colour scheme for this quilt. If we go back to her original one, she hasn't got a colour scheme either. And she obviously likes greens, so there is a fair amount of green, but that could all have been off of the same fabric. I don't know, I don't know what she was using. And she has unified it by satting around the outside of each block using a cotton sateen in white or off-white, which gives it that lovely sort of glow. You know, it's sort of, I don't know if the camera picks it up, but it's almost sort of shiny or a sheen, like, I don't know. Like mother of pearl, it's that sort of effect. And then all of these little squares in between, they're all made from the same fabric as well. Um, and then the little squares around this bit, they're all, they're all made from the same fabric too. She's unified it by using, which is a really good trick anyway, in um, patchwork and quilting, if you want to make lots and lots of different blocks. As long as you can find a sashing, something that's gonna act as a sashing, you can unify pretty much anything, trust me, I've done it. I'll show you a few more of my blocks and a, and a few more of the fabrics. There's this one. So I've used this, same fabric again here um, and I've also used this delightful one I think this is another Ginny Bear so you can see you can choose this motif or you can choose the stripes for doing different things and it's so amazing the sort of optical illusion that you can build up it's like a kaleidoscope almost you know when you twist the two the two bits that's what that's what it looks like for me. So when I first started making it, I think this is my first one, which is much more like hers, you know, very definite crosses. And I still really like it because I, I love the rich colours and I will probably do more of this sort of thing as well. But I just got completely carried away with making kaleidoscope patterns. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, it's, it's just so much fun. I really enjoy doing it. So you can see I've tried to sort of keep to the feel of a lot of the fabrics she used. But it's really dependent on what you can get hold of. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll literally just put down a load of fabric for you to see. And that's pretty much all I've got in the way of fabrics. But given that I've only made about six or seven blocks, I'll do a gallery at the end actually. So stick around for that because um, my mum's lent me all of hers as well because she's making the same quilt and it's fascinating to see the difference that two people can be inspired by the same quilt at the same time and what we came up with. Um, so stick around for that at the end but I'll show you how to put all this together. So we'll start a new block. So we need to choose some fabric. So I think really quickly I'm going to choose this one. I think I'm going to put it with this one. I've given my fabric choices a quick iron 
it's one of those times that I would say please don't stint on the ironing. It makes quite a difference when you're trying to cut things out and match funny patterns and things. So I've, I've ironed all mine and I'm toying between finding this motif here. I think I've only got two though. So there's two of those and two of those. I could do them opposite. If we put this on here, you can see it makes quite a good shape like that. Sort of line it up like that. What, what I'll do is I'll turn the fabric over. The beauty of um, these prints, as you can see it quite clearly on the back as well. So I could use a bit like that opposite each other. So there's two of those. And I could also use this bit or I could use the template on these lines here or I can do it like that. If you do it that way with a, a line running across it, each one will make a square. Um, so it'll make a square in the centre like um, this one here. So that's made a square in the centre and I don't know if you remember back on the original quilt she had quite a few with little squares in the centre. Or you can just do it with the straight line across and that makes more of a cross shape to start with which I haven't done. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should do that then. I think I'm going to go for this. This Oh, can you see that? It's the same as this here. So I'm going to cut out four of these. So that will make the first, first four in the centre here. So I'm going to cut those out. But I'm also going to decide what I want to do next, which is probably a little bit foolhardy, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Four of those. And then I think I want to do, using this black here, I think I want to do that so it ends up with a double bit next to each other. Do you know what? I'm going to start off by cutting out four of each and laying them out and seeing what happens. On the back, I can see quite clearly the pattern that I want to cut out, which is this line here. What I want to do is I want to center this sort of diamond in the middle of each piece. The main point is to make it as equal as possible, line up any reference points that you can. So you can sort of guesstimate the distance here. It's like a, a fingertip. I'm doing this with my arms around the tripod. I'm just gonna do one so you can see what I mean, okay? And just draw around the template. Yes, I'm using the trusty biro again. Just making sure that I've got enough as a seam allowance and it's mostly centred in the shape. It's not too bad, it's a little far that way. That's probably because I'm uh, foreshortening everything because I'm sitting quite a distance away from it. Honestly, they don't need to be perfect, perfect, perfect because your eye will just make it read that it is. Just do your best and have fun. I just wanted to have a quick word about cutting. I know there's all sorts of people out there that will say, but Ellie! <laughs> You're always going on about being frugal and not wasting fabric. And this whole entire quilt requires fussy cutting. And that is absolutely true that there is a little bit of wastage in some places. But honestly, it's not that much. And I keep all the bits. Just be careful with it. Don't go hacking it out first. <laughs> it's one of those occasions where it's really not a good idea to cut it out roughly and then go back and trim it afterwards try and do it as best as you can straight away you can see what's left of the fabric obviously you can't do this with a rotary cutter scissors are required i've cut all the pieces out that i said i would so that's what that'll look like and you can see it makes a really lovely cross i changed my mind i didn't go for the solid black i wanted to get the blue in there i decided that that was so effective it would be really nice to make it look like this border goes all the way around here unfortunately what I need to do is stitch all of these together first so I can see where the seam allowance takes it to and then lay it out on the fabric to work out what direction I need to put my little viewfinder template in. At some point I will cut out the other pieces to make it look like that's a continuous square all the way around and I think that'd be really really effective. So the next thing we need to do is to put these on papers and this is one of the few times when I would say actually pin it into place. So if you lay your piece down you can see the pattern and then try and get it so that it's equidistant across these two lines this has got a really lovely vertical that we can follow and what I'm going to use as a point of reference here is on one end I'm going to have that point of the paper meeting the long point of the star and then slide a pin in it these have been used before so they've already got pinholes in which is kind of handy so I'll do all of those and then I'll start sewing them on when you're doing fussy cutting it's a good idea to tack actually through the card itself or through the paper whatever you're using to hold it into place I'm just using a um, short straw needle uh, so it's very very sharp and then what I should do is just show you 
when you get to the point, if you folded it over like that, it makes it quite sort of bulky. So if you, if you fold one side down and then fold the other side down and then just squash and make sure you've got a stitch that goes through that pointy bit, it means it's easier to stitch the points together when you come round to do the putting together of the all the pieces. So I've tacked two of these together and I'm going to show you how to stitch them together. We need to put the right sides together and start from this long side here and stitch to the point. So I'm going to just turn it over. So I've put a knot in the end of my thread and I'm using the same needle as before. This thread doesn't match on purpose, it's literally what I picked up first. So the first thing that's most important is to catch these two folds here right at the corner and then do another little stitch there and then that will hold it firm because when this opens out it's actually going to be like that so that's the point where we've just reinforced it with a couple of stitches it'll just make your life easier as you go through and then we're literally just going to whip stitch um, through the fabric and you should be able to feel the paper on one side of your needle so on the underside and the fabric on the top of your needle and you can use the paper as a guide for your stitching and if you do that you just sort of put the point in and let it just guide across the top if you're using any force at all then it's probably going through the paper and just keep doing that all the way to the point and because of the weird shape of the hexagons you you will be fielding for thread around corners and things it, it it just that's just the nature of the beast really not much we can do about that and um, you should be able to get about uh, 15 to 18 stitches to, to the inch <laughs> but you don't need to count them but more than 10 is a good idea you're all going to rewind this and count it aren't you no, I mean I normally manage between about 12 and 14 and that should hold it together perfectly well and then at the point where we've sort of folded down that fabric don't stitch through that little flap just stitch the bits that are actually folded around continuing on from here and then leave those flaps don't stitch through them at all and just keep going all the way till you get to the very point of it and then you can finish that point off because this middle bit is probably the easiest to stitch together because what I'll do is I'll make two this shape and then I'll stitch those together in a continuous straight line so let me just over stitch coming back a bit just make sure it's not going to come undone and just do a little through the thread thing not like that though right there you go and then cut your thread off open it out so there's the first part and you can see what I was saying about it's okay to finish off at the point here because I'm going to make another one exactly the same and then we'll pop them on there and stitch all the way across the middle um, later on <laughs> we'll be setting in set in points so you can see on here we've got the four here and then you have to stitch these in and these ones are a little bit more fiddly I will go away and do the other one of these and then I'll come back and show you how to join them together. So I've done my second one of these and now we need to stitch them together. So exactly the same as how you did before, start off at the corner, do a couple of stitches through the point and then whip stitch all the way across the middle. As you get to the bit where they all join, just make sure that you're attaching point to point, point to point and then through the stitching as well and then you won't end up with any holes in the middle part. I've just done the last bit and I whip stitched back to about there, that's it, no hole. So that's the beginning cross of one of the patches. I've also tacked one of these and I'm going to show you how to put this part into this part. Decide which way around you want it. So remember I wanted to make mine look as though it was going to have a continuous square. So this dark black line um, acts as a sort of, uh, what's the word? When, when your eye looks at it, it's more definite than if I do it the other way around. It would still make a continuous square, but it wouldn't wouldn't act like a sort of border there. So I want that bit there like that. So take your needle and thread again and again I'm using a little knot 
and then decide where it's going. Mine's going here and then so if you hold it where it's going and then just literally fold it over straight away and then put the corners together here. You can see that it's a little bit short there and that's because we're dealing with our slightly truncated points. So we can pull the fabric as we get to here, we can actually pull this fabric out and stitch it in. That's, that's why you don't stitch it down. Then when I just folded it over instead of folding it square if you see what I mean. Once you start doing this you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about a bit more. So go through right on the point. On these corners they're likely to be far more accurate than the the points of either end so that's why I always start with these these corners here for stitching and again like before put in a couple of stitches to hold that in place so it doesn't move around. Again let your needle uh, glide across the top of your papers and then whip stitch all the way to the point and we're pulling that fabric there. You kind of get a feel for it after you've done your sort of first few pieces. You get a feel for the how much you can manipulate the fabric and how much you can unfold it at corners and things. So I just got to the corner. You can't take your papers out of this until they're surrounded on all sides. So you end up doing a lot of this kind of thing. But if you're using um, papers or cards or whatever after a few, few goes... They, they soften up a bit but you don't have to bend it you can you can manipulate it quite easy and then the most important bit here is right where these um, where this turns the corner is to get underneath the flap of fabric on the point and get down to where the paper is um, it'll take a little bit of finagling but you'll be able to do it and then just again put a couple of extra stitches in that that bit just to reinforce it and then whip stitch to the end so there we are that's that one stitched in I just noticed there is a very slight hole in the centre, so I, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll just um, stitch these points together a bit more. But honestly, who's going to notice? <laughs> it's only, only in the name of being, uh, what's the word? Revealing all mistakes, whatever. Anyway, stick around and watch the gallery of all the blocks that me and my mum have made. looking through all of the different blocks made by me and my <laughs> my mum. She has obviously been a lot busier with it over the years than I have. However, I've made other quilts. <laughs> um, but isn't it interesting looking at the different, the different arrangements? Remember, these are all made out of long hexagons and the, just the array of optical illusions and colour combinations. And honestly, it is, it is so much fun. I really hope you have a go. I hope this has inspired you and given you a little kind of look into what inspires me and what possibly un inspires other you know, textile artists and artists generally. Um, and I, I really hope you start your own English paper piecing journey with either the normal hexagons or with these long hexagons because I think you'll find it completely different to any other type of handwork or quilting even or patchworking. Thank you very much for joining me and um, thank you to all my new subscribers as well as my, my trusty old ones. And I really appreciate all your support and all your comments. And if you'd like to support the channel further, remember you can like, you can subscribe, you can share my videos to your friends. And I also have a Ko-fi account. Or the link will be in the description and I'll see you again soon. Bye!